Welcome to Distributing Solar. We speak with entrepreneurs and experts working in the off-grid solar industry around the world, bringing to life how distributed solar is changing lives in emerging markets. In this conversation, we speak with Andreas Lerner, co-founder of Trine. Trine is a European crowdfunding platform that enables retail investors, that's non-professional, everyday individual investors, people like you and me, to invest in off-grid solar projects around the world. They provide debt financing via loans, so the investment is clearly set out with regards to expected payback periods and interest rates. To date, they have raised over 36 million euros of investment for off-grid solar projects working in East and West Africa, Latin America and Asia, and over 10,000 investors have invested through their platform. We talk about how Trine got started, the value of sustainable and impact investments in off-grid solar, but also about their longer-term goals of building a sustainable bank and why the broader global financial investment landscape needs to change. Please note, this does not constitute investment advice, and the information here is for informational purposes only. Andreas, welcome to Distributing Solar. Thanks. Uh, happy to be here. So you started trying in Sweden, but you're originally from Austria. I'd love to start by understanding a bit about how did you end up in Sweden and how did you come to start trying? For me, everything started going back to high school when I watched An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. That documentary had a really big impact on me. I think I watched it three times in a row or something like that. And it just made it clear for me that I want to contribute with whatever I'll do during my life. And in particular, in that one, obviously, climate change. I think I was 18 around that time. So that set me on a, on a trajectory where I, it was very unclear what to do because climate change is a huge thing and it's, it's obviously not a silver bullet to fix it. I picked my studies after that in environmental energy management. At some point during my studies, I got this desire to go abroad. So I went for an Erasmus to Finland. And in that time, I went to Sweden once or twice and I really liked the country culture. I studied sustainable energy systems here, so I'm, I'm actually a background engineer. And I jumped into a lot of in sectors like uh, electric mobility, renewable energy to figure out where I really think I can add value. And in retrospect, if it all makes sense, but I was just trying out a lot of things and I realized I want to work with solar energy. I also, for some reason, decided I want to go to Kenya for uh, education on sustainable energy or sustainability in emerging market. And after all of those experiences and working at a startup in between and doing like a startup training for students or graduates, I, I decided I want to start a company. I didn't want to work at big companies because I just wanted to, to get things done and not have to do internal politics. So then I brainstormed a lot of business ideas with one of my now co-founders, Christopher. And a friend of mine, uh, Jung, and we had an idea that we wanted to follow. It was actually not this one. It was a different idea. And uh, I remember I went to an event one day where you pitch your idea to get people to join you. And we had a more like a technological solution. But I was not an engineer that could build stuff. And Chris was neither and uh, Jung was neither. But I went anyway. And it's kind of yeah, getting out of your comfort zone or putting yourself out there. Because at that event, I met Sam. And we were sitting next to each other. It's, it's kind of like a fairy tale story because we were pitching our own ideas to other people. And, and we both were pitching ideas with solar. And he was pitching originally the idea of, of this crazy idea that we could finance solar for crowdfunding. And, and I heard his pitch and he heard mine. So after that, it was a typical startup event. So they had beers and uh, pizza. We just had a chat and then we met, I think, a week later and then he woke me for his ideas and I just walked him for my background and we just decided let's jump on the financing idea because it really is the one that has a big impact in the bigger picture. And that's how it all started. And that was about five years ago. That's a great story. And tell us now more about Trine. How does it work and what does Trine do and what are your objectives as a company? What Trine does is you could call us an intermediary. So we are connecting people that, that want to put their investments into sustainable assets because investments have a huge impact and I can talk about that for a long time, but 
basically connecting investors in Sweden, but also in the EU with companies in emerging markets that work in the off-grid solar space and are in need of debt finance. So what we provide to the borrowers is uh, working capital debt. So anything that is backed by assets and it gets financed by people from Europe. And that's individuals like you and me, anything from 25 euros on also institutional investors like development banks and DFIs and we're combining those different entities, you could say, or investor profiles and provide the finance that is dire needed in our sector and obviously now even more than before. We have done around nearly 100 loans and we have financed about 35 million euros. When it comes to our goals, we really want to enable those companies that have that impact and we want to enable like a greener future and a better world. Like our mantra is it's for people, planet and profit. We are starting in the off-grid solar space because there is a huge market need for finance. And there's also a huge impact socially, but also environmentally with the finance we're providing. Much more if you would finance a solar panel in Sweden. But in the long run, what we're really building is a sustainable bank. We could go in a lot of different sectors in the long run, from agriculture to transportation, because we have a huge challenge ahead. And we have to transform basically all of our economic system. I mean, we've done 35 million euros so far, but we are really, we want to scale this big. So, I mean, we are talking about 10xing what we're doing and even beyond that. And you mentioned there's a huge market need at the moment for solar energy in particular in emerging markets. Can you tell us more about that challenge and for our listeners who perhaps don't understand the cost of debt financing in some of these countries, can you give some background about what the other options are for the entrepreneurs working in emerging markets and why try and provide an affordable solution? There is a lack of finance in, in the off-grid solar space in particular, but I guess it's, uh, it applies to a lot of industry sectors in emerging markets. And I think it is to some extent due to the perception of higher risk that maybe some more commercial investors would, would see. It's a more informal market. It's not as simple as, for instance, in Sweden, where you can go online and request the credit rating of a company and you see all the background in a PDF. At least the markets that we are in, it's, it's very informal. It's a very craftsmanship kind of investment field. So you really need to understand the market you're investing in. You need to uh, build your way of assessing the companies and you can't really rely on much market data. Uh, and that's as true for investors as it, as it is for companies operating in those markets. I mean, the non-transparency of data or even more so the non-existence of data is often very tricky. When it comes to the finance we're providing, the other options out there would, would be on one hand local banks, which often have very high interest rates. Uh, in some countries, they have been dropped recently, like in Kenya. But overall, it's often very high. And it's, it's, I think it's partly due to their risk perception. And if that's a correct perception of risk or not, can be discussed. Obviously, if you don't understand an investment as deeply as we do, for, for example, then it might be leading to a higher risk perception. But so the local banks are very expensive, high interest rates. Then there's philanthropy, which is also great to get something going. But then there is a lack in between. And, and I wouldn't say that we're cheap. I mean, we're for profit business. We have double digit interest rate numbers. But what we can offer, for example, compared to those banks is flexibility. Like we are not a very ingrained bank with ingrained processes. We, we are ourselves early stage company. So we understand being an early stage company and we're really customer oriented. So we're really building financial products that fit the market. And we listen to our customers and really try to provide them with the finance that they actually need and not what they can find out there. So we're constantly developing new ways of financing our existing in your borrowers. Can you tell us a bit about some of these ways of financing the customers that are more flexible, that are more catered towards what they're, they're looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think one one model is what we describe as just in time finance. So, I mean, we approve borrowers on a certain amount of, of funding for a certain period of time. We are flexible when to draw down that money. So you don't have to take a loan and then you don't use it yet. So we really finance assets that are actually coming in and that are being used more or less very shortly after you receive the finance, which means that you actually, your use of capital is much more efficient. Uh, and we have the advantage as well that we're not a fund, so we don't have to deploy money, actually raising the money when we need it. And in other ways, I mean, very flexible in, in terms of tenure, in terms of grace periods, moratorium periods on decision, what we finance. I mean, a huge part of our finance is unsecured. 
but then we've also done security test finance. So I, I guess bottom line is we do a lot of things and there's a lot of ways. And we, when a company comes to us and is really like, Hey, can we try this out? And we actually see value in it. Like what we did with Asuri now, uh, a model of financing that makes sense for both of us. Then we, we really are very eager to try it out and jump on that opportunity. Great. So it sounds like you've developed a number of innovations and been creative around the side of the borrower and on the side of the lender too. It is an, an entirely straightforward story because a lot of the lenders potentially see the projects as high risk and try and provide match funding for the projects. Can you tell us more about what the match funding is? How does it work? And what has the, the feedback been from your customers? When it comes to, to the offer to the investors or what has worked, I mean, we have tried out match funding. Yeah, that's, that's true. We have worked with DFID in the early days. We have worked during the last few years with corporations, mainly in Sweden, that see match funding as some sort of, well, you could see it as a CSR kind of thing to do. Um, it's, it's good publicity. It's good communication. Uh, it's just great for those companies because we're living in a time where we're shifting mindset and more and more people actually see that sustainable investment is a big thing that we need to do in order to solve our problems. When we look at how hard it affected investors, it for sure provides a boost in funding because if you have a match, every euro gets matched during a certain period of time, you're creating some sort of fear of missing out maybe. It's not the right word, but it gets the idea across, I think. And it also gives validity to the business model. And that was very important in the early days because we were, nobody knew us. Uh, it was four crazy people in Sweden that we decided we're going to raise money for companies in Africa. Please invest. Um, so obviously having a company there that people recognize was very helpful. We haven't done much match funding in the recent days. Actually, now we're more looking at co-funding which might say, sound very similar and, and maybe it is, but it's more like getting investors and in that sense, it's often institutions to co-invest in the loan, more or less on the same terms as the investors and provide the benefit to them. So it could be, for instance, first loss, meaning that the risk perception on the investors and actually is lower because you know that that big institution that maybe you haven't heard about, but you can Google, is funding along with you. So they believe in this and also your risk is actually reduced due to that. And, and I think that had a huge impact and, and will have a huge impact. I and mean, we have CEDA as well, providing a guarantee. And I think for all of those institutions, on the other hand, it's this thinking that you actually bring additional capital to the space because what we are providing is no capital that will come to the office of space. This is money that would have done other things, maybe just be in the stock market in Sweden or be in a bank account and, and basically doing nothing. So we actually, there is a huge additionality in those millions that we're providing. And I think the institutions see that as a huge catalytic uh, effect that they want to support. Great. And can you tell us more about the the first loss provision that you mentioned that you secured with a number of organizations, including CEDA? How does that work and what is its value for lenders and customers? There's different types of, I guess you could call it first loss. With CEDA, it's a guarantee, which means that they are contractually stating, we're going to guarantee a certain amount of money. In CEDA's case, the initial was 10 million euros, and we're going to guarantee 10 million euros of loans to 60%. So if any of the loans that you put underneath the guarantee defaults due to whatever reason and cannot pay the payments that are due, we will cover 60% of that loan. So you, when you invest as an investor, it's relatively straightforward in that case that you know, well, worst, worst case, I'm going to lose 60% of what I've put down. So if I invest 100 euros, I'm, I'm going to lose 40 euros. I'm going to keep 60%. So I'm going to keep 60 euros. Um, and that obviously is a very attractive for investors. It is very attractive because on the stock market, you don't even have insurance. Like you could lose everything tomorrow. While here you have pretty clear downside protection. The other one is first loss investing, which is basically like an institution. We're wrapping up a current deal. I cannot mention the name yet, but it's going to be live in the coming week, I think, where they just invest alongside the crowd and they take the first loss, which means their investment is due at the end of the repayment schedule of the loan. So if they, say, finance half of the loan, all the repayments that are due on the loan until the last repayment, say in three years from now, will go to the other 50% of the investors. So you're getting much more repaid than you should actually get repaid according to the share you have in the loan. 
those 50% of investors get 100% of the repayments during the period until it's the last payment where the risk of default is very small. So if it defaults in the middle, say in a year and a half or two, you have gotten more capital than you would have gotten otherwise. So it gives you that kind of reduced risk perception. It's probably less powerful than a, a straightforward guarantee because you don't really know how much you're going to get with the guarantee you have, a, like a bottom line. But that's that's another way of, of investing the first loss. And that's kind of the, the two ways that we have mainly focused on. I mean, you could have grants that are not repayable either. We haven't really touched on the grants itself. So yeah, guarantee and first loss uh, core investing is, is the main things. And I imagine that these provisions were provided to the potential investors to try to encourage them to invest in the sector and to give them some sense of security and assurance that the money won't necessarily be lost. How has the market evolved in the last few years? Was it difficult to get your first customers, as you say, to you know lend money to four crazy guys with this amazing idea? And how do you think the market will evolve going forward? Yeah, I mean, in the past, it for sure, I think it was hard to get off the ground because you're launching a bank, basically, and and you don't have any track record. None of us has been an entrepreneur before. None of us has really worked in the finance industry either. So it was challenging, I would say for sure. But we had the advantage that we're building a very clear value that you're investing in. So we got a lot of investors in the beginning, and I think we still have a lot of those that are investing because they want to do good. So a lot of the early investors, they were kind of like, well, I give my money to charity. Here, I actually might get money back. So that sounds great. And I'm still doing good anyway. So I, I just at least use a portion of my money that I would have used maybe in charity and try this out. We've also used other crowdfunding platforms where they kind of do a bit of a due diligence. That was our first loan, kind of to just build an MVP, minimum viable product, and get some traction, get some users. So early investors, for sure, mainly the environmental and social focused ones. Now, we we have shown track record. I mean, we have raised 35 million euros, but we've also repaid over 10 million euros. So we've actually shown that the business model works. I mean, you're getting repaid. And, and we see a lot of the repayments being reinvested very shortly. Uh, and also in investors that get repaid, increasing their investments because now they have actually seen the full life cycle of being a user of trying, you can say, or an investor at trying, you actually get your money back. So we're getting more and more investors that are bigger ticket sizes, not just 25 euros, but a thousand, 10,000, 50,000 euros still being individuals. We're having institutional investors coming up, talking to a bunch of development banks, which hopefully, in the, like I said, in a week or two, one of them should go live. And going forward, I mean, I think this will just be a no-brainer in the long run for people to invest sustainably. It's, it's uh, the thing we need to do. It has a much bigger impact on your climate footprint than anything else that you're doing. I mean, recycling or not traveling as much by plane is great and it's it's also needed. But actually, where you invest your money, where you invest your pension, has up to 27 times the impact of what you do in your everyday life. It just doesn't feel as immediate because you're used to needing this tactile feedback. But actually, just clicking a button and changing your investments online has a huge impact. There are market trends that just tell me that this is just going to grow. This is not going to go anywhere. It's going to become the new normal. If it doesn't, then we have actually a bigger issue, I would say. And I'd love to hear more about the social and the environmental impact that your money can provide for you. Can you provide some more background or color on the social and environmental impact that the companies you're financing are creating for their customers and the work that they're doing? We actually worked together with the UNDP to do an assessment according to the SDGs on one of our borrowers. B-Box, which is a solar home system distributor. So whatever applies to them applies basically to the solar home system industry. And they found out that they meet 10 out of the 17 SDGs. So you have a huge environmental and social impact with uh, supporting those companies. I mean, it's anything from eradicating poverty, SDG 1, to good health and quality education because you're replacing kerosene lamps that have really dirty fumes. And children have to study with them at night. And now actually they have clean, much better lightning through LED lamps, power. So you don't have any local emissions. 
and you you can study much better with that like you, you also meet gender equality um, because you empower the women in the households now there is actually also information coming in through watching tv and obviously you bring affordable and clean energy which is sdg7 yeah you you help those economies those those markets actually leapfrog because they don't have to go and do the same mistakes as we do they did that before with the landlines. They didn't actually install landlines. They jumped directly to the mobile phones. And now they have the possibility to not invest more in, in fossil fuels, but actually jump directly to clean energy and decentralized uh, production without needing the grid lines that are very expensive. You, you meet uh, decent work and economic growth because you actually enable companies to hire employees to grow and also maybe work that is a bit more challenging. You invest in infrastructure, SDG 9, uh, especially when you look in the CNI space. You reduce inequalities because people have more opportunities now. They have access to information. And obviously, you do climate action. I mean, you offset CO2 emissions. It's very clear. It's, uh, it's, there's no fear of additionality because you're actually offsetting CO2 emissions that would have been there otherwise anyway. And lastly, you have the partnerships for the goals, because obviously our industry is, is very reliant on partnerships. But but you can see this industry is really at the forefront of social entrepreneurship and environmental leadership, I would say. And there is some issues that need to be addressed, obviously, as any in any growing industry, from battery recycling, promoting gender equality and not just having it on the paper. But I think the people that are working in industry, they have this very much close to their heart. And it's just core to this industry, I would say. And speaking of some of those entrepreneurs, can you tell us about some of the projects you've worked on? You've just mentioned Beebox, which is a pretty significant project. I think it was the largest debt financed project that had been raised in the sector. Can you tell us more about some of your projects and the companies that you're working with? And then perhaps how you find the companies and how you decide which companies to invest in and which ones not to invest in? Yeah, I mean, we work with a lot of companies across the spectrum. So it's very inspiring to see like a lot of different approaches to a similar problem, I would say. I mean, on the one hand with Beebox, uh, one of the biggest solar home system distributors out there. And you kind of see where the other companies that are maybe the, the second wave will go and, and what challenges they might face. You have Greenlight Planet, also one of the big solar home system and solar lantern distributors, manufacturers, both of them very integrated as well, meaning that they manufacture and distribute and have the customers. And But also, I mean, that's that's the solar home system segment. We also have Taste of Power, which works in the CNI space, a commercial industrial solar, which so is much more targeted on the infrastructure aspect, actually providing a productive energy use as well at least on the commercial industrial level. So there you have a very different business model, very different customers, slightly different impact. I mean, you have less of uh, people with energy access, but much more of an infrastructure. And actually the climate impact is also huge. And then you have Kingo, for example, that we work with in Guatemala. Very interesting business model, much more on the side of actually uh, becoming a utility and having very much more long-term relationship with the customers. And actually also having raised this kind of issue of, of energy access to a more wider audience, to a public audience, because I mean, they got Leonardo DiCaprio to, to join them. And I think he invested and also joined the board, but it's, uh, he was spreading the message and, and people get to know about this world through people that they might not have heard about this before otherwise. So we are very much across the space. I mean, Beebox is one of our biggest borrowers, but Queen of Planet is as well. And, and what we've done back then is it's actually for us becoming the new normal. For instance, our framework contracts or what you would say, what we want to disperse to a company during a year or so is, is around 10 million euros by now. But it's, it's just great to grow with those companies and see how they are changing their business model, how they are changing their approach. When it comes to how the process works or how you can become a partner to try and or borrow to try and we're trying to be flexible and fast. We're really trying to get the money out there as soon as it's feasible and makes sense. I think our lead times are around two months max, three months. It depends a lot on the borrower and, and supplying all the material. But but basically how it works for borrowers you you just apply for loan, mainly done through tryin.com slash finance. There we have like a submission form where we just ask very basic things 
just to get to know the company a bit and see on a high level if it fits the investment policy and, and what we are investing in. And after that, we we walk you through screening, we have calls, we, we do a very high level analysis and do something that we call pre IC, where we just check again on a bit deeper than initially if this makes sense. Um, and if it does, we go through the whole due diligence, which is not very different from other companies, I think. Financials, management, markets, the customers, if it's uh, pay as you go, what's the portfolio looking like? And we also visit the company on the site. So we actually come down, we have a team of investment managers that uh, visits the clients and just make sure is what we have seen on paper and in our course making sense. Uh, do we see this out there and does it fit still? And if that all looks good, we just go for our investment committee, decide on uh, if we want to do the investment finally, and, and if, if there's any other conditions, and then we wrap up the final negotiations, the contracting, and we put the loan live. And then it depends a lot on the size of the loan, how much time it takes. But on average, we are able to do this from start to finish in two months, if it's fast. Three months, uh, more more common. And then it also depends on if it's a million euros that you request in the loan tranche or if it's uh, 200,000. And then we have an ongoing relationship. So what we do is we really want to build partnerships. We're not like a one-off shop. We really want to grow with our partners in funding. So when they initially need 200,000, that's fine. And we can grow with them to 10 million. And like I said, we want to grow 10 x So because we're tapping into a source of finance that is theoretically, it's very abundant. Retail investors out there have a lot of money sitting on bank accounts. So we keep a close partnerships, close communication and release loans as long as, as all the requirements are met and have new tranches going out every month or, or so and just hope that we can be part of the long journey of our borrowers. That seems like a very swift process for the entrepreneur and I'm sure much appreciated within the sector. And so for the investor's side, how does this work for them? How do they decide to invest their money and what is the process that they go through? Sure. I mean, on the investor side, it's actually even more straightforward because we're really heavily banking on, on digital finance and we're trying to build as much as we can on the borrower side in, in that regard as well. But for the investors, I mean, you just go to trend.com. If you're a retail investor, of course, that's what I'm explaining here now, but you go to trend.com, you see uh, loans that are live. There's normally two free that are funding at the same time. And if you really like what we do, if you believe in, in the investment, opportunities that we provide you decide to sign up so then you've signed up and it's just like signing up on facebook really you provide some more details of course and you need to do a questionnaire once you're actually investing and then you need to provide kyc so um, that's semi-automatized because we need to know who's investing we don't want to be a money laundry place where people just come with their dirty earnings and then they put them into something good and they get it back and they can happily spend it somewhere else so so there's a kyc know your customer which means your passport any identity proof depends on if you are an individual or a company that normally is not that difficult for because it's for any retail investor it's maybe two or three documents to upload and then it takes a day or two to be approved and then you are good to go so you just pick your loan you read on it uh, you can ask us any questions of course we're always there with a chat function and if you are ready to invest you, you pick your amount whatever makes sense the suggestion is always to spread your eggs amongst uh, several baskets so don't put everything in one i think that's a general investment advice and you can pay by credit card or by bank transfer and then you just need to wait until the loan is fully funded which depends on the loan size but can take anywhere from a week to a month and then you have invested and we just what we do is we collect all the money and we send it to the borrower and you can follow what's going on there we communicate with you anything that's happening if there's any problems and once they start repaying you you see repayments in your dashboard and then you can decide if this proves the business model and, and sustainable investing itself or if you just want to take it out and, and buy yourself a coffee that you can do as well and then you can get the money transferred back to your bank but yeah it, it's relatively straightforward i would say perfect and can anyone invest or do you need to meet certain thresholds for example in in the us you often hear about accredited investors and is it currently available to all countries or a specific number of investors 
Yeah, so so we have the fortune that we don't have that strict of a limitation. So for us, it's anybody that resides in the EU can invest as long as you're not a politically exposed person or obviously the KYC check needs to go through. If you're not approved, then you can't invest. And that's most of the time really only if you are close to a political person because then there's a risk. And then you can invest anything from 25 euros. So, I mean, that's kind of going for lunch two times in Sweden. Uh, you can invest that. You can invest 10,000 euros. But yeah, I mean, it's very like what we're trying to do here is really to make this accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, and I think that's what we have achieved so far, at least in Europe. And you've mentioned that the projects can take from a couple of days, maybe a, a bit longer to fund. Are you currently as a company constrained in terms of your growth by the types of projects that you can find and the projects that you are looking to invest in? Or are you constrained by the number of investors that are looking to invest through your platform? Can you tell us a bit about that that dynamic and whether it changes perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on that a little bit there. So, I mean, we are a two-sided business, so we are fluctuating in between the two. Maybe not constantly, but regularly. I mean, obviously, finding good deals is important. And sometimes you might hit a period where you have less opportunities on the table. The investment opportunities that you have worked on is maybe not as good in the, in the last stages. Actually, we've never really hit an issue with funding. We have never had, for instance, non-successful funding. We, we always could meet the demand of financing. The coronavirus, as we are currently talking about this in May 2020, has a bit of an impact on funding, of course, because if you lose a lot of money on the stock market, you might not be as interested in putting this into maybe sometimes uh, as perceived more risky countries. But that has actually been recovering. So, so I would say it's, uh, it fluctuates and it's probably, if I would have to pick one, I would probably pick this, the deal side because it takes more work. It's more time consuming. It takes more people because you really have to go deep and travel there, meet the companies so that even though we try to really do it fast, if you do it for a lot of loans, it, it takes time. It takes more time than signing up an investor, I would say. Do you typically find that the customers that you have joining a project are repeated investors? So they have already invested in previous projects or are there a lot of new investors who have just found Troin and are excited to invest? Uh, yeah, it's actually interesting because we see a lot of free investments. Um, so the lifetime value, you could say from a startup vocabulary of our investors is huge because once you really started investing, you're going to keep on investing. And once you get repayments, you're increasing investments and you're going to keep on investing. I think one factor maybe that uh, hinders this mechanics a little bit is is that we have a lot of repetition loans. I mean, we have, I think now Queen of Planet 11 live, they start power 13. So it's like the 13th tranche to the borrower. So some investors have invested the amount that they wanted to invest in that company, uh, especially if you think from a portfolio point of view, and they're more looking for new companies. So I would say for, for existing borrowers, the baseline is still existing investors, but it's a bigger percentage that comes from new investors just because existing investors are not willing to expose themselves uh, as much as they did in the beginning. And for new loans, so new borrowers that just go live, like I think we had Yellow Solar, it's one of the newest ones. There, it's it's a good mix. I mean, but a lot of existing investors just jump right on the opportunity, and those loans get very that get funded very fast due to that mechanic because it's a diversification play, and you believe in the product, you believe in the investment. And if you're an, an existing investor, so long story short, it's actually a lot of existing investors. Yeah. Which countries are you currently working in and are there any countries that you're particularly excited about and interested to work in? We are heavily still currently in East Africa due to our history. That's where we started. Kenya was the market where we did our first investments, but we're also in Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda. We have investments in Nigeria, in Senegal, so a bit in West Africa as well, but also in Southeast Asia with Pakistan and Myanmar and, like I said before, with Kingo. Uh, in Guatemala, in South America. And we are generally very open to countries. Like we don't have a, 
I mean, obviously, there's a blacklist um, of countries where we wouldn't invest in. Maybe in North Korea might not be the best place. But uh, besides those obvious examples where there is war or where there is problems, we we are pretty open. What we're really excited about, I would say, is West Africa. It's kind of the next step for us, obviously, having had a very strong focus on East Africa, and in particular, there Nigeria, due to, to a huge extent, also the mini grid market there that is really shaping up partly because there is subsidies coming in now that are kind of needed to get the mini grid sector going. And there is actually really some bankable opportunities on the table to, to jump onto the mini grid sector. So, I mean, in, outside of the geographic focus, I think what we're really excited about is also the mini grid space. Uh, it's still a lot of work needed. We're far from where we are with solar home systems, but I think there is signs that it going to be a sector to look at and Nigeria has a lot of support for it and also in the CNI space and Nigeria is uh, having a lot of opportunities and it's a huge market anyway so uh, so that's I think what we're excited about. And maybe that's a great time to start talking about some of the learnings you've made as a company. It's obviously been uh, an incredible journey that you've been on. You've gone to build not just a company from scratch, but in many ways also an entire sector from scratch. What have your key learnings been as a company and have there been any lessons that have been particularly difficult to learn or painful to learn? Yes, there was for sure a lot of learnings when you started company from scratch we we had to have an attitude of learning from the early days because you're building something that you don't really have full picture about especially most of us didn't have an extensive background in finance i mean sam my co-founder has done finance for solar in the u.s so there was a bit of an understanding what it is but at the same time it's very different when you do it in emerging markets and then also the due diligence that you're doing is very different from what you do in Sweden. For example, I mean, it's a lot more, like I said, craftsmanship to some extent. You need to really know what to look for. And, and that took a lot of learning. I would say the early companies that we financed are not companies that we would finance today anymore. With every investment, we learn something in the, especially in the beginning, the first eight, nine investments, just really understand what it is that makes a good company, what makes a good investment case, what are the financial products that we can offer and what are the financial products that we should offer. As a company as well, I am sure every founder would say that hiring is hard. Learning who to hire and where to find those people and how to how to know that they fit the culture, that they have the knowledge that you need in that particular role is something that I think we're still learning, and but we got much better at it. And in general, we have a learning culture. Like you can make mistakes, that's fine. I don't say, I think we embrace mistakes, but most mistakes. It's fine if you do them once, but if you do the same mistake several times, then it's really an issue and, and those things can break companies. But in the early days, really, we, we tested a lot of things. Um, we did A-B testing as well on the investor side. So meaning that you test two different hypotheses on the homepage, uh, and see what the reactions are. And, and there you do a lot of learning on things that work and things that don't work. So that's what I would say on a, on a company level. On a personal note for myself, I would say as a founder, I in the early days had this idea that I have to be able to be good at everything. And that's obviously unrealistic. And you have to be able to distribute tasks. You have to be able to, to let go and, and hire people that are better than yourself at that task and, and reinvent yourself constantly as a founder. As, at least in my case, it might not apply to everybody. I'm, I'm a generalist more or less at heart. So I'm, I, I'm good at a lot of things, but I'm not great. Um, and then you should hire those people uh, when you scale. And also, like as a founder, you don't need to be a good manager. It's fine in the early days not to be great. And then later on, you, you have to hire good managers and learn from them if you don't learn by yourself. And for me, it was more that I had to learn or I, I'm willing to learn from people that we have hired. But uh, it's hard. It's hard sometimes to reinvent yourself and it's hard sometimes to let go of things that might be seen as prestigious externally. Because you have an ego and your ego is there and you cannot deny that it feels good sometimes. 
there's a lot of learnings. It's, it's impossible to put them all in uh, five, six minutes, but uh, those are the ones that come to mind. For the market as a whole, for the off-grid solar industry and, and the debt financing industry, is your goal to attract more commercial investors into that sector and to really grow the potential of that market? Do you see the sector moving towards that direction? And do you think eventually we'll get to a place where a lot of commercial investors and large sustainable funds potentially are investing in that space looking for market rate returns? Mm. The answer is, yeah, for, we definitely see commercial investors coming and we see on the equity side already, which is not only the, the typical names that we know in this, in this space. And because of focus on more environmental or sustainable investments, there will be more and more commercial investors that have to jump on this as well. I think the biggest question is really if they can access the risk, but then you couldn't provide them with the, the service, what we do basically. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to do is to get commercial investors into this space. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is to merge retail with institutions. Yeah, they might not have invested in emerging markets or in these sectors per se, but they're for sure going to look at sustainable investing. That's a, that's for, that's a no-brainer. I guess there's currently a split between the retail investment sector where you have individuals deciding where they want to invest their money. And then you have on the other side, institutional financing, where you have very large professional funds that are investing into this space. And what it feels to me that China's doing is certainly working in the retail space, but is your longer term aim to move into the, the professional investing space to really upscale the size of your investments so you can invest billions of dollars in, in the way that many of these funds are operating? Or is it always going to be really focused on, on the retail side? Currently, we're very much heavy on the retail and I think we're, we're adding a lot of value there. But I think in order to uh, enable us to really hit the, the goals that we have for us, I mean, really being a big part of the solution and, and shifting the world of finance, we, we also need to be in other places. We definitely see retail investment as a core part of our business because it is the core of where the money comes from. I mean, the money in banks is not money of the banks. It's the money of the people that put it in the banks. We just forget about it sometimes that those huge, huge institutions actually only have money because people gave them money. Huge development funds, uh, DFIs, they only have money because we pay taxes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. So I think the retail segment has a huge potential. We're definitely going to stick with it. But we also see that in order to hit scale fast, we need to look at other sources of funding as well. If we're not finding the secret key to really getting millions of people into this tomorrow, I think it makes sense for us to partner with institutions. And we're already doing that. We have, like I said, an institution that is soon ready. Uh, we have two, three that we're talking with. And basically the idea is to blend them together because that's, at least with the institution we're talking with today, that's where we're adding value as well because they are providing, to some extent, catalytic capital because it actually unlocks more capital. And that's where we really have a strength today. In the long run, I don't see anything for us not to go also to the to the billion fund kind of schemes because, like I said, I think the core of the company is people, planet, profit. As long as we can invest in things that we believe in and I guess sometimes in the bigger scale, in the billions, it becomes less transparent, it becomes a little bit really less possible to follow up on. That's going to be one challenge to work with. But in the long run, for us, we see retail and institutions to, to work together on our platform and give benefits to each other or just invest on the same terms as long as they provide capital and we can actually help them put the capital to good use where we have knowledge and currently that's the off-grid solar space. But the idea is, like I said, to expand, to go to other segments in the long term and to really become good at those segments and then provide the knowledge to investors that want to invest the money in the segments without having to acquire all the knowledge that we have acquired through the years. So you've provided a lot of financing to companies working in emerging markets and around the debt side. For trying as a company, how are you funded and how did you raise your equity funding? Tell us more about that process of raising equity for your company and what your goals are going forward. How it started, I think, is the, the typical startup funding journey, I would say. I mean, we, we did a pre-seed round in the very early days just to cover expenses to get off the ground. 
And then we did a seed round with, at that time, mainly angel investors. Actually, I think none of the investors we had at that time was even connected to this space. So this was a, a kind of a fintech investment. And, and then we just started building the product, started gaining traction, showing some results. Uh, and then we raised our A round, which was around 6 million euros. And that was led by, well, it's a mix between a family office and a VC. Goosebong Invest, um, based in Stockholm, they really did the majority of that equity round. And then we had also some some angel investors that wanted to come along that had knowledge that we wanted, some of them having experience in the emerging markets of grid solar space and some having experience in other areas like product development. And we just wanted to have them on board to have uh, people close to us that we can can talk to and ask for support or questions when we when we face an issue or we, we don't know how to handle a problem. So that's how we're mainly financed for equity. Uh, and actually, we're also currently raising our next equity round. So if there's any equity investors out there, uh, happy to talk. But yeah, it's equity. Uh, that's how we financed ourselves. Great. And going forward, what are your goals and what is the longer term vision for Trine as a company? I mean, the longer term vision is kind of connected to what I've said earlier. So we don't see ourselves in the really long run as a pure off-grid solar uh, investor. We definitely want to be there. We want to take a huge space uh, and support the companies. But uh, once we once we've hit investment volumes, maybe that are too big for that sector, we we also want to focus on other sectors that fit the people, planet, profit, bottom line, triple impact focus. So that could be anything from agriculture to transportation. So so we for sure see that we're going to diversify what we finance in the long run. But for that, we will need to add more teams and really have nailed the investments of the off-grid solar, where I think we still have some learnings to do. And in terms of everything else, I mean, we really want to make this a, a funding unicorn. So we really want to 10x what we can raise. Uh, we want to blend finance. So we Going to have retail investors, but we also want to get other sources of financing into the mix and really provide a very tangible uh, investment opportunity for people that want to do good. While on the other side, supporting the entrepreneurs that are doing the changes that are needed. Currently, this is the solar off grid space, but there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there that are doing uh, really great things. Great, and it certainly fits within the the larger industry trend around sustainable financing. Can you speak more about your approach to that sector? What are your thoughts around sustainable financing and sustainable investing that you think will be the longer term trends and longer term output? Yeah, I mean, I think the the most basic way of looking at it is just that we believe that uh, sustainable financing or impact investing will be terms that will be in the past because they need to merge with traditional investing, if you want to call it that way. Because traditional investing is not going to work. There is just no rational to invest in the old way. Um, I mean, there is a lot of information out there. There is movements like the divest movement that are not just based on purely, oh, we need to rescue the climate, but they're also very rational. I mean, McKinsey had a report where they looked at the climate change impact on the housing market there. Um, I think it was around 1.5 degrees Celsius. And what that would mean, it would mean billions of dollars being lost due to rising sea levels. So from a pure investor perspective, it just doesn't make sense to let that happen. A lot of our money currently is in assets that are so-called stranded assets, which means that their valuations are bloated. I think the Financial Times put the $900 billion mark on that one. And that's probably not even capturing it. They're just not future proof because those valuations are based on uh, fossil fuel in the ground that cannot be extracted, be it coal or oil or gas. And those uh, investments will in the long run either implode or will need to be shifted. And that's what we see with the divest movement with big investors and pension funds actually pulling out the money and putting it into more sustainable assets. And, and I think we have seen now with the coronavirus that if there's a real issue, regulators will act, governments will act uh, maybe too much or too little. We can discuss that in a different conversation. But once the climate change crisis has hit home and people actually realize what Greta Thunberg tells us every day, but we just don't want to look at it because it's too big of a task and it's too daunting. Once people will see it, hopefully not too late, 
action will happen. We have seen it can. I mean, we have seen that governments can act if they really get pushed to do so. And if we push them, they will do that. And then you actually have a regulate the push. And if we're still driven by market economy, but then the push from those asset classes into more sustainable ones, they will be looked at from investors because they need to put their money somewhere and they need to put it where it's future-proof. So we for sure see a huge trend a lot of people becoming more aware of, of the impact of the finance, which, like I said, is 27 times the impact of anything else you can do. Actually, ESG investments, they are outperforming the traditional investments already today. So so there's just no rational not to invest in this space. Um, and again, to come back to where I started, impact investing, sustainable investing it will not be a thing because it's going to be the thing. It's going to be what we have to do and what people will want to do as well. And we've obviously seen at the moment a huge impact of a COVID-19 and coronavirus on all countries in the world. And there are particular concerns around the really adverse impact it might have in the emerging market. Can you tell us more about what you've seen around the impacts of COVID-19? COVID-19 is in itself partly unpredictable, so it's obviously hard to predict the future. But what we have seen so far is actually a relatively limited effect of it. I mean, since since COVID-19 started becoming a bigger thing in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and other markets that we're in, we started really to actively monitor our portfolio even more uh, on exactly that, how it affects uh, the portfolios of the solar home system, basic companies, uh, and also the CNI companies. And we haven't seen a huge effect. I mean, we've seen effects in countries that are at the time of this recording in lockdown, which is Nigeria, Rwanda, and for instance, Pakistan. There we have seen like a bigger impact on the portfolios to some extent. But actually, on the other hand, we have seen uh, the opposite in other markets where companies actually record their best sales months ever because Either they got picked as an essential service and they can still operate anyway as normal in terms of installing and selling. And also the customers currently prioritizing paying for electricity because they're at home much more. They still have some funds that they can use to pay for electricity and it just makes more sense for them. But in the long run, if this takes a long time and actually affects the rural population more or there's more lockdowns, if farmers can sell their produce, this will have an effect, that's for sure. And, and we see companies reacting, either giving free electricity for a month or so, just to, to actually help the customers. We see that the industry is coming together with a, with a relief fund initiative from, I think, all major investors in this space to provide a similar support as the governments have done in Sweden and in, in other markets like the US. So we see that coming up. And uh, to go back to the question, I think currently we don't see huge warning signals. We don't have any loans in default. We don't have any restructuring currently due to coronavirus. The companies that we're working with mainly have the cushion currently to go through this and have a bit of a drop maybe of revenues. It might hit the earlier entrants more than the established players. Obvious reasons, I guess, because those established companies have a pretty big war chest in terms of funding and are also in different countries. They're not only exposed to one country. So it's a mixed picture, but it's currently still pointing towards the positive, being cautious that this obviously might change relatively fast. That's very interesting. Thanks so much, Andreas. And we'd like to move to our quickfire round where we understand more about you as a individual and then the company as well. To begin with, can you tell us where your company's name came from? Sure. Actually, we had uh, several names in the beginning, but in the end, I mean, what I said before, we want to provide a triple impact, triple bottom line product. And Trine is Old English, and it refers to the triple or the triangle. It has, it, I think it has different explanations, and that's why we picked it, because it just really incorporates the core of what we want to finance in its name. It's a bit hard to pronounce sometimes. But we, we take that and we hope that uh, some people know how to pronounce it in the future. Great. And if someone is looking to get involved in the off-grid solar sector, either as an entrepreneur or as an investor, what advice would you give them? I think core to an entrepreneur is a uh, focus on your customer. And that applies in the off-grid solar space as it does in Sweden when you start a business here. 
And it, it applies to the bottom of the pyramid, to any business that really works with the BOP. And it's a huge business opportunity. I mean, if you want to start a business as an entrepreneur, that's where I would start. I mean, it's exciting. You're solving real challenges. And it's a huge market. It's maybe not in one country only, but a billion people. That's a huge market that you can target. Um, so I would focus on customers. I mean, sometimes there might be this preconception that, well, they, they don't have electricity and now they do. That's fine. So that's good enough. Let's move on. But actually they are just like us. They're comparing services all the time. They are not happy if something doesn't work and they are going to switch fast. So I think just making sure that at least in one way or another, I mean, it's, it's, uh, the distribution is hard. Um, but just making sure that the customers are happy is is very important for success in, in this industry as in any other. And otherwise, I mean, I think when it comes to the off-grid solar industry in, in general, it's just reach out if you want to know something. If, I think this industry is one of the most welcoming sectors that one can decide to join. And everybody is in here for a bigger reason than just making money. Obviously, we're building for profit businesses, but we're also having other things in mind. So, so just reach out. That's what I would give as an advice to an entrepreneur. And I think some of this applies to an investor as well. And what do you do when you're not working? Yeah, when I'm not working. Now I have more time to not work than I had in the early days. <laughs> um, so, so I try to balance myself really. So I do all kinds of things. I have a quite extensive morning routine now, which is I have to cut down probably soon. I wake up quite early, do my yoga, do some meditation, and, and really try to to balance the stress and, and all of the things that come with, with being in an, an early stage company and lots of sports just to get the body and mind balanced. And I think that's that's really important to be productive as well. And I imagine I would know the answer to this question, but if you had one request of our listeners, what would it be? If I had one request, well, I have actually two. So if you're an, invest if you're an investor, please reach out to see how we can work together and, and provide the finance that is needed to make this sector and, and in the future any other sector succeed. And if you're a solo company, obviously, we are here to support you and, and provide the finance that you need. So if you haven't talked to us yet, if we haven't been on your radar, just reach out. We have all of our emails on the homepage. There is trying.com slash finance, where you can actually apply for finance uh, and just send us a message and we, we, we see what we can do. Perfect. And to close our conversation, what are your predictions for the off-grid solar sector for the next five years? Yes, predictions. It's probably not the best time to make predictions. Uh, with a lot of things are unpredictable in, in coronavirus, but I think there's for sure some trends in the market that we can see. Um, I think one is consolidation in the solar home system space. There's a few big, big uh, companies out there already. There is the second wave and there's a few that are even coming in a third wave. In some countries, maybe not overall, but in some countries we will probably see consolidation. Also because equity investors are just not willing to invest in everybody. And in, in markets like Kenya, it's uh, it's a bit crowded right now. So that's that. I think in, in terms of market development, I for sure think that the mini grid sector will become more and more viable. Uh, currently, it's still needs subsidies. But I think once we have hit some sort of economies of scale, tested business models, some of the components that are needed, for instance, uh, battery prices, if they are uh, continuously dropping, the sector will become more and more viable. Even if it's on-grid or off-grid, uh, it still uh, provides very reliable uh, electricity. And the same in the CNI space, the commercial industrial is something that we are very excited about. And we see a huge traction in some of the markets and it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense. You have a customer that is much more reliable in some aspects, at least, than, than a, a customer in the rural countrysides. So you, you have a much easier to analyze uh, off-taker to some extent, I would say. And, and that those two together, mini grids and CNI, I would say just also show the trend towards productive use of energy and actually I mean, the solar home systems are great. They're solving a need. They're providing a lot of services, but they, they are limited when it comes to the income generation, but then actually elevating people out of poverty in a bigger scale. And for that, you really need productive use and local production and, and value addition. And I think that's something that we've, we see a lot of companies looking at. They become more viable with mini grids than they are with solar home systems. And then CNI is in itself already productive use as well. 
So, so I think that's the third angle that I would say the market is moving into. That's been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you for joining us on Distributing Solar. Thanks for having me. That was our conversation with Andreas Lerner from Trine. If you have any questions, feedback or comments, please visit us on our website at www.distributingsolar.com. We have notes from our podcast, useful sources and contact details available. We're particularly keen to speak with local entrepreneurs in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia and Latin America. So if you have any recommendations for interview guests, please do get in touch.